The very tools that can help you understand something are now being used to create misinformation. 73% of Americans believe that the data that they see online is something that just can't be trusted. We are deeply concerned about that. If people can't trust the data that they see, then how could they possibly create trust between themselves? There is room now to be just as innovative about the principles and the ethics behind what we're doing as we are about the technology itself. For six years, I was one of the writers and producers on Silicon Valley. And my role there was to help lead the technical authenticity of the show. As part of our brainstorming for this fictitious company, we realized that there was this incredible opportunity for our protagonist to lead an effort to decentralize the web. As we got to researching that plot, I ended up going to the Decentralized Web Summit that the Internet Archive put on, and it was a really life-changing experience meeting all these people that were firmly committed to new principles about how to recreate the Internet. As I was researching this technology for a fictitious company, I was also realizing that there were some really cool real-world applications for this. What I was really passionate to figure out is how could we take nascent technology from the decentralized web and give it a clear and intuitive case study. And that's what the Starling Framework is. It's a joint project co-founded by the USC Shoah Foundation and Stanford's Department of Electrical Engineering. Starling transforms the preservation of our most historically sensitive documents by placing them on the decentralized web. The USC Shoah Foundation is an archive of over 55,000 testimonies of witnesses to genocide from around the world over the last century. The mission of the Shoah Foundation is to develop empathy, understanding and respect through testimony. So in fact, the mission is really about not the testimony itself as valuable and as precious as that is, but what it means in the world, what we do with the testimonies that we have to challenge and change our world. They do this in order to ensure that the very detailed accounts of what these survivors went through are never forgotten. The testimonies that we've collected are being preserved in perpetuity, and it turns out that perpetuity is a really long time. So how do we ensure that as we hand on this archive to the next generation, that we can be absolutely certain that it will be pristine? So with the technical leaders of the Shoah Foundation and some of the top engineers at Stanford, we worked with an array of dedicated companies to take 25 petabytes worth of data, architecting a way so that we could distribute all of this information across a new decentralized archive. What the new blockchains let us do is effectively write to a public ledger that anybody can write to, and anything you write to that ledger stays on that ledger and never goes away. And that by itself has many capabilities and applications that we're only beginning to see the use for. So we began the project by looking at storage. What we did is we used next generation protocols like IPFS and Filecoin to help ensure that as the data was spread out to a variety of different nodes, that that data was still secure and that we knew that the data still had integrity. And then we realized that what if we actually started a bit earlier and we were able to take our chain of custody and begin it actually upstream with the cameras. And so we worked with HTC to develop a special set of applications and firmware on the new Exodus 1 phone to use new hardware-based encryption to take directly off the sensor of the camera signatures and hashes that would be able to create a seal around the image and ensure that that seal could not be broken. So now we have a system that proves that this image has been secured through each step of its journey. We decided very early on that the Starling framework was going to be built on case studies because we wanted to basically lead by example. Reuters, for its entire history, has really been dedicated to the objective capture of information to be able to then disseminate into newspapers and media organizations around the world. And so we began a relationship with Reuters to explore how our technology could be very helpful to the work that their photographers bravely do every day in creating photos for the Reuters Newswire. 
Now, a newspaper, when they embed images in the articles that they publish, those images could have digital signatures embedded in them. And it allows me as a reader to verify that the images I'm seeing, they've not been fabricated, they've not been edited, and they've not been enhanced in some way. We cannot take it for granted that the archives of today are going to be around for forever. In choosing to look at the testimony of genocide survivors, we're choosing data specifically because it is sensitive. Specifically because if it was destroyed, this would be a tremendous loss to civilization. Today is the 27th of February. I'm here to uh, record a testimony, and the language of the interview will be English. We started with the Shoah Foundation's canonical case study, the Holocaust. Working with the Foundation's engineers and researchers, we cryptographically recorded testimony and then piloted a way to bring that testimony into the archive. At the same time as we were capturing her testimony, we also equipped the Shoah Foundation's team to go to Iraq and document the plight of Kurdish refugees who are fleeing a dangerous, pre-genocidal situation. And this was an incredible juxtaposition of two very different types of case studies. And that was a really important way of being able to explain the power of testimony for us. So we went as far as Iraq and Syria, but then also deep into the Amazon rainforest. Pablo Alborenga is an award-winning photojournalist who covers the defenders of the rainforest. We deployed our prototypes with him so he could give voice to the struggles of indigenous people that are being persecuted for their profound beliefs in the environment. Human rights activists are worried that climate change will be one of the biggest precipitators of violence and genocide in the future. So by using decentralized technologies, we are able to empower indigenous people in all the remote technical environments they find themselves because we wanted to ensure that the world's most important allies on the front lines of global warming cannot be silenced. In a time of manipulated speech and fake news and deep fakes, what we wanted to do with this project was say, we know for certain that this testimony was given at this place and in this time by this person, and this is their testament. <laughs> What this changes is that now video becomes an historical document. Because you can verify precisely where and when and how and whom that document relates to. This actually changes the game for how we document history, period. In every line of computer code that a programmer writes, they're sending a set of instructions to a processor, but at the same time, the programmer is also coding ethics, they're coding morals, they're coding even civics into the very code that they're writing. Starling is not a platform. It's a framework that places tools and ethics on a level playing field to be able to be inclusive and bring as many people into the process to be able to help us design the right way to build and implement these tools. This is not a perfect solution. Instead, what we're really trying to do is bring as many people to the table as possible to empower end users to contribute to the cause of preserving historical memory.